um, to put the yes paste on the back. That's an archival glue that you may want to take note of. And yes, you can see it's well loved and well used. <laughs> and um, I actually started the cutouts last night. Uh, this is the first one. It is a branch and I'm definitely going to be adding more color with my paint brushes. Um, I put on the back of it um, pieces of mat board, archival mat board, to put glue onto and put onto the lower part of this watercolor. And I'm going to put weights on it. And um, I'm going to try to quickly cut out and show you how to back other shapes like rocks and um, human made step, man man made stepping stones that will go across the, the ice. This is Matheson Falls. Have you ever been to Matheson Falls? Is it in Michigan? No, it is near Starved Rock State Park. It, uh, Matheson is in Oglesby, Illinois, and Starved Rock is in Utica, just down the road. And this, um, I'll pass around one of my cards that I had painted of it as a straight watercolor a few years ago, actually starting with a pencil drawing onto the watercolor paper with freezing hands. You know, I love winter. I'm from Michigan, and that does have something to do with it. I have fond memories of being bundled up by my parents going up outside in too many layers of clothes and really enjoying cocoa and a nice hot fire afterwards. What I am going to do now is spread Yes Paste on the um, mat board extensions here. And with this book, um, this well-loved Shakespeare book, of course I want to impress you with my vast knowledge of Shakespeare, I'm going to use it to press down the weight. And then I'm going to make small images and back them so that, again, you're not watching water boil. Now I'll tell you how, as I'm putting paste on the back of these uh, pieces of mat board, I'll tell you how I came into working in this manner. You've heard the, express, the phrase, haven't you, necessity is the mother of invention. I needed three watercolors in a short period of time for a show in Kenosha that I was invited to be in at the Anderson Art Center. And it was on flowers. So I looked through my flat file found a watercolor that I had abandoned a few years before because it had a diagonal in it that was too strong and I didn't know how to get around it at the time, so it was lying there. And I cut it up into a number of shapes, put lifts of foam core and mat board in back of some of the shapes, and darned if it didn't sell for nearly $2,000. Oh. <laughs> so hopefully after this demo, you will go home, look through your files, find something that didn't quite work, and start cutting it up, and um, enjoy the results. I will probably end up putting more extensions in parts of this piece afterwards um, when I take it back to my studio. I also needed a winter scene for um, the show that I have coming up that the curator of the YMCA uh, in Northbrook, the North Shore YMCA, um, has asked me to have in April. And I didn't because it really needs something to, uh, you know, to interrupt the shape <coughs> and brings even more life to it. So I'm going to press it down first, and then I'm going to let Shakespeare do the rest. <laughs> um, but first, before that, just so that you know that I have aesthetics firmly in mind, uh, I'm going to mix some Venetian red and um, ultramarine blue, and I'm going to make a reddish brown. Sounds like somebody's being contacted by a fan. <laughs> okay, so this is going to make it pop forward. And I've probably painted 10,000 trees in my life, so 
I don't have to look at a picture of a tree. Um, I've looked at this scene so many times, I can practically paint it blindfolded. You know, um, it's common for artists to go back to a particular scene that really <laughs> gets their juices pumping and um, paint it again and again and again and again, and that is what I'm doing. Um, Monet did that with Rouen Cathedral and Haystacks. Um, Cezanne did that with Mont Saint Victoire. Um, you know, and um, a number of contemporary artists also still go back and paint the same person. You might remember who I Ivan Albright was, right? Um, when the last part of his life, he did a number of self-portraits and they were actually, uh, do you want to say, um, they were actually documenting his illness. And um, it was probably something that he planned to do for a number of years if he ever became ill. But it was very interesting to see them at the Art Institute. Strangely enough, he's one of my favorite artists. My mother always thought his work was absolutely dreadful because <laughs> of the amount of grisly detail he would have in his portraits, but I really found them fascinating. And Madeleine Albright, who was the Secretary of State, was also someone who I was a fan of, and I actually did her portrait for um, a show called Dreaming Bigger in Strange Times at Woman Made Gallery. And um, I found out in reading her biography um, that she was his um, daughter-in-law. I mean, she was married to his stepson at one time. I had, not, I had no idea that there was a relationship there. But anyway, that's one of those facts that has very little to do with watercolor, except for the fact that I talked about how artists like to sometimes paint the same thing over and over and over again, and Albright liked to do his own portrait his own self-portrait, oh, many, many artists do. Okay, so this is what it looks like now. Dumb. Doesn't that do a good job of breaking up the monotony here? Mm -hmm. right. So the next um, item of interest here is a rock. And I found this rock in what I had cut out earlier as a shape to begin the branch with. So let's go with that. It is going to go in this corner, and it's going to have a lift of a foam core, because that will bring it up just that much further, quarter inch foam core. And I'm going to use this old one from my bin. No one will know, and I will paint the edges in acrylic, because people can see the edges of foam core. And it's a very kind of humble but necessary art material. All right. And <clears throat> this is both an intellectual and an intuitive process, this part, so I'm going to be as intuitive as possible and just assume that, ah, this rock is going to work. Does that work? Looks yeah. Good. So thus, with your permission and with your endorsement and your interest, <clears throat> I'm going to paint it and I'm going to leave parts of it white to show that there was snow there. What I really look forward to do, doing is painting this this series of icicles hanging down from the, um, from the foreground. I almost can hear one of Beethoven's symphonies uh, while I paint that. And it's, um, you know, it'd be wonderful if we also had music, but it's also wonderful to have your enthusiasm. You if, the, if there are any qu questions along the way, please let me know. Uh, I have a question. Please. So your skull and your painting, does that have a watercolor paper attached to your foam? Yes. Yes. This is 300 pound watercolor okay. paper. The Mercedes Benz, the creme de la creme of watercolor paper. <laughs> and boy, you're an inspiring group. <laughs> Keep them coming. Okay. I'm sorry, did you mention what you use to, as an adhesive between Yes, yes paste. What is that? Y-E-S paste. Oh, yes, paste. Right. I'll tell you how I found out about yes paste. I used to go to Ico's Art Materials when she was on Wabash Avenue and later on Oriental Papers for, from the craftsmen that would make them. And in um, 
right after grad school at Bowling Green State University, where I graduated with an MFA in 1980. I did mostly collage work for about five years until, and I did mostly watercolor in college itself. In grad school, I was um, young and naive, and several, several of my professors who were abstract expressionists that had all gone to University of Iowa together at one point, and were all hired by Bowling Green back in um, the 50s, I think. Um, you know, they were all men, and they would say to me, I needed to get rid of my objects. Well, any, if anybody told me now that I needed to get rid of uh, um, my objects, I would tell them something unpronounceable. <laughs> but at the time, I was, you know, I kind of listened. And sure. my graduate thesis show was called Transparencies. And what I had done was I had taken watercolors from life drawing classes, for instance, and put um, sheets of oriental paper um, and um, <clears throat> acrylic matte medium and gloss medium and modeling paste over them. And they were quite interesting. You could see the realism through the layers of, <clears throat> um, of paper, et cetera, translucent. But when I got to Chicago and looked around at my, at my new work in my new studio, I thought, who am I? You know, am I <clears throat> newly an abstract painter? Or am I, uh, who studied realism for years and then went on to something else? Or am I truly a realist? And the answer is, since then has been, um, I'm a little of both and I'm a lot of both. Um, there, there are many things as an artist that we want to say in our lifetime. And sometimes I can say it best with clay, which is a medium that I used, um, <coughs> learned rather, in order to do a city mural, organize, design and organize a city mural for the city of Wichita Falls, Texas. I did a lot of ceramic plaques. It's now a permanent part of me. And the three-dimensional watercolors were kind of a precursor to clay in many ways. Okay, I am cutting a shape that is approximately the same shape as the rock with snow on it, which I am going to perfect later. This is the rock with snow. It's going to go right here. And someplace it's going to need a bird, but I haven't quite figured out what kind of bird or where. This card, if you want to pass it around, is of Matheson Falls in the fall. And it does have a bird in it. It has a, um, a hawk. And the story of that I'm looking for my razor, my blade, because I just lost it. It's in the board. It's in the board. Right there. In the fall. Right. In the fall. It's in your hand. In your phone. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. You're good. <laughs> um, the way the hawk got there, five years ago, February 4th, I, got a, I was working on the watercolor thinking it needs one more thing before I truly sign my name, but I can't quite figure it out. I got a phone call from a friend telling me of the, of the very tragic death of another friend of mine, of ours. Stunned, after our long conversation, I went back to the watercolor and I painted in the, the, the falcon. And every time I look at that watercolor, I think of Kathy. And I even showed it on an easel at her memorial. And I do sing, too. So it was on the easel next to me when I sang in heavenly love abiding. I'm telling you too much about my life. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's who I am. I'm not just a painter. I'm a human being. And I think it's important for artists to be human beings. So oftentimes we get absorbed in our art and we think that that's all that we are and it's all that we live for. I will live for art, but I won't die for it. I'm not Van Gogh. I get plenty of rest. I eat the right foods. I see friends on a semi-regular basis and I'm good to my husband <laughs> and his children.
Okay, so here is how I have put the foam core on the back. I don't put it all the way to the edge because I don't like people to see it. Oh my goodness, I took the book off, didn't I? Or did I even put, put it on? I never put it on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to just, just make sure, just for assurance. I'm going to put Shakespeare on there. And um, oh, what was I going to do? Okay. I'm going to put this on the back, the glue. Oh, you have to paint the edges. Sorry, oh. yes, I have to paint the edges, don't I? That's why I brought this Blick paint. Uh, do I have any other side of blue? No, I don't. I just have blue. But I do have gouache. And I think there might be some gouache on here already. I'll just use that. I don't like to get too complicated. All right. Gouache plus Venetian red and the blue. Okay. Let's see what we've got. Here. Okay. Acrylic, here we come. I'll do the best I can. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? Right. Uh, it's going to be two blue. So I'm going to add some of this red. Mm -hmm. That'll make an interesting combo. Because it's orangish red, it's going to be brown. Yay! Okay, let's see what we've got. Blue. I'm going to have to wash off the palette because I've ruined palettes by adding acrylic because it doesn't come off. All right. Now we've got just the shade. It's going to look good when you see it from the side. You won't see the humble material called foam core. All right. So there we go. Doesn't need to be neat because all you're seeing is the edge. Sometimes we are um, too careful and conscientious when we don't need to be. The important thing is to know the difference. Yes. Whenever I frame anything, I'm very conscious of every speck of dirt that needs to get out of the frame, and I'm conscious of edges and craftsmanship. I don't care what some of the contemporaries say, and I'm a contemporist also. Um, craftsmanship is important. Any questions so far? So that's acrylic wash, not watercolor. Well, this is acrylic. I'd started uh, by mixing gouache with the combination of uh, ultramarine and Venetian red, and it just it still was translucent. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to paste this down. I'm going to use my fingers. Uh, yeah, this works better sometimes. All right. Doesn't matter if you mix in some paint with the paste. Anybody know any good jokes? <laughs> All right. How do you frame your work then with, with it being 3D? Um, I use spacers at the edge, and um, for this painting over here, um, which is the center one called Crystal Winter, painted on location at, in sub-zero weather. I was wearing an old fur coat that had probably at one time been several thousand dollars, but it, fur coats like, um, you know, like machinery do not go up, in, except for certain cars, like Mercedes, do not go up in value. Um, so I was sitting on a fur coat on several blankets and drinking hot chocolate from a thermos. Okay, I just glued on the rock. And I'm going to take this off because I don't think you all want to look at Shakespeare about that much. I did curate a, sh a show called Chicago Artists Interpret Shakespeare that is to get into the ice. I love painting ice. So I'm going to get the approximate shape. I'm going to cut it out first. I'm actually going to draw it. And again, I'm trying to work fast. So far you've got a rock and a branch. <laughs> and uh, if anybody has any suggestions about birds, let me know. During break, I might paint a bird, cut it out, and put it on someplace. 
Okay, this is going over the edge, so if I'm cutting it, these can show underneath, and I'm going to paint them more um, <clears throat> distinctly, but I'm going to have another layer going over it, so you can see that layered effect of, of uh, seeing shapes underneath what I put over. How many of you out there would like to try this sometime? I do workshops on them. I did one recently at Alma Interiors that went swimmingly. That is a gallery in Chicago. There is a combination um, interior design showcase, and it is also a gallery, and they had very robust openings, etc. But I was invited to do a workshop there, and uh, I can show you some images that the students had done later if you'd like to see them. But you know, keep me in mind for a workshop sometime. I'd love to teach you all and help you get your hands in this stuff. So, do every one of your paintings have? Articles in them, uh, shapes in them that um, stand out away from. No. Um, in the stationery you see there, you will see that all of those images are watercolors painted pretty flat and pretty traditionally. We didn't hear that question. Yeah, the question was Do all of my watercolors have three dimensional parts that stand out? Um, the answer is no. This is something that I do um, as a specialty sometimes when I'm motivated to. When I f just feel like something says this needs to be 3D. And I know that there are other artists that do work this way and have probably taught themselves the way I have, but um, I don't know too many. And, do you usually choose like three to five? collage added pieces like do you have a specific number or do you just put them on until you please? I put them on until I'm pleased. That's an excellent question. And I'm going to try to <clears throat> cut this out fast. Again, it's a little like watching water boil. Okay. The key has got to be to have a very sharp and fresh blade. Yes, and this is sharp and fresh. I did bring an extra. I also brought scissors. And I may cut the under part of this with scissors. You also want to make sure that you cut all the way through so that when you pull it away, you don't have parts um, that tear. You also I, bring band-aids for when you cut this <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent idea. A little blonde. Should have, oh dear. Remember when Julia Childs cut herself in one of her uh, cooking demos? Oh dear. That's for the flavor. <laughs> Suppose I put passion into my cooking. <clears throat> when I taught for um, 12 years at this design school, which is now Sanford Brown University, it changed names, um, I used to give demos regularly. One of my students said to me, um, you know, you really remind me of Martha Stewart. Did anybody ever tell you that? And I said, what I did was perfectly legal. <laughs> anyway. I thought you'd enjoy that. Well, she made the most out of her time behind bars. Well, she benefited from a... Um, stock tip that her stockbroker gave her. He told oh, her right. to sell this one stock that was a um, medicine, that, that was a pill or a medicine for a particular type of cancer. And yeah. he said it's going to go down, so you may want it to sell. I mean, to me, that is such a small crime, and mm -hmm. it's not even, I don't even consider it a crime myself. I mean, how many people um, you do know would have done just the same thing? What did she do in prison that she benefited from? Um, I think she taught cooking classes. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday Night Live did, you know, a, a hilarious imitation of her in prison. Okay, this is what I've done so far. I know you can see it on there, or can you? Um, 
Yes. There. Mm -hmm. And I'm working fast. So far, I've done a branch in a rock, and now a group of ice balls, icicles. Shakespeare wrote a sonnet once called When Icicles Hang by the Wall, and I don't know it. I just remember that one of the phrases is, Well, greedy Joan doth keel the pot. That's all I remember. I thought that was humorous. I like humor. It adds spice to life. And would that yes paste be something that a person could use to do a whole sheet adhering to a board? That's what I used. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I spent over 45 minutes putting yes paste over this entire sheet. That's why you may want to start with this small. <laughs> Okay, this is the back side. The back side looks perfectly pristine. The front side does not. And I'm going to take some paper towel here, which I should have had some sheets torn off of late earlier. And I'm going to put it in the water and take off the glue. Yep. If it's not completely dried on, it comes off very easily. Does it not dry? Could get it off my hands. Hmm? Does it not dry too quickly? Um, if if the if you're doing it out on the porch in the summer or spring, it does dry pretty quickly. But if you're in a cool environment, it doesn't. I mean, last night I was um, after I had finished spreading the yes paste on the back of this, I did go over the first area, which was up here on the back, and put a little more glue on because it was tacky, but it was not damp and I didn't want to see these come up. Because it's, um, it's not great craftsmanship to, um, to see it, to, to see the edges come up. And there's an edge here that's, that's coming up and truth be known, I didn't put an extension on it. I may or may not. Sometimes they're fine just the way they are. Woo! Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that cool? Yeah, I like that. What I don't like are the pencil lines, so I will get rid of them. You know what? I hope I brought a robust eraser. If not, I can simply deal with it later with gouache. And that's what I'm going to do. <sighs> because harmony is much more important to achieve in demonstrations than perfection. If you look at something that an artist has done and say, like that. Uh, that's great. If you look up close and you see a few um, areas that uh, the artist missed, that's fine too. It's all part of a fluid process. Oh, well, you know, intuition. What works? If it works for you, it's fine. If it doesn't work for you, then correct it. Oh, you know what? I need to put a bit of an extension back there. I was having such a good time that I didn't put an <laughs> extension on. Well, you guys are fun, I swear. I'm really glad I came all the way to Skokie last night and stayed with a good friend and I'm here this morning. I'm just having the time of my life. Um, as long as I keep you entertained and curious, that's what my goal is. All right. I'll even do some happy little trees. Ooh. Seems like quite a few artists are leaving pencil lines in their finished work these days. Mm -hmm. Is that not something you would do? It just depends. Sometimes I think it's, it's nice. It shows the spontaneity. If something is um, you know, tighter in construction, like super realism, which this is not. I mean, this is more of an impression than super realism. Um, then I think it's fine. I may paint over the lines using gouache and a little bit of mixed gray. I'm not a purist in the sense that I think that gouache is cheating. 
I learned watercolor from a purist named James Green. He was my main professor at Principia College. And we learned an awful lot from Mr. Green. The thing about him though, he if you were a male student, you got lots of attention. If you were a woman student, he treated you like you were there to get your MRS and he didn't degree and he didn't pay much attention to you until he saw that you were serious. By the time I was a senior, we, we were very good friends. But um, when I was a uh, beginning of my senior year, I went on a trip with him and 23 other students called Art Abroad. And many of us are in touch today and continuing to work in art. It was a trip of a lifetime. We went to England, France, Switzerland, and Italy. And I still have work from that trip in my portfolio. Okay, this isn't totally neat, but this is what I put on. And I'm going to put another few small shapes here, which I probably already have, in order to give it a little more lift. Yeah. Yeah, baby. You know, we haven't seen many ice falls this winter, have we? <laughs> I feel sorry for skiers. Yeah. Absolutely. Cross country skiing. Snowshoeing. Yeah. That's what I like. Yeah, I'm sure that there are places in Colorado that make their own snow. And I'm sure, I think that Colorado got its usual measure of snow this year, did it? <sighs> this is being a culprit. <sighs> My husband wanted me to use his big thick knife and I told him no. This is for delicate work. Some of it. The one time I ever went skiing, I was 14 years old, it was to a small slope in Holland, Michigan, near where we lived. And several members of my class and their mothers, our mothers, all went. And that day, number one, I saved someone's life. Yes, I did. And long story. And number two, I was having a good time on the beginner's slope, feeling like I was really learning the stuff. And I went up in the chairlift, and the person next to me said, have you been up in the chairlift before? I said, no, this is my first time. And she said, oh, you're going to kill yourself going downhill. <laughs> and so in getting off the chairlift, we had to jump off with our skis. And I jumped off my skis just fine. Well, she didn't. She fell and she twisted her ankle. And the medics were up to get her and put her on a stretcher and take her down. And then I was standing uh, at the top of the slopes, trembling, wondering how I was going to get down safely. I skied down, you know, bending very carefully, and I missed a tree by about that much. Oh. So I thought, nope, I don't need to do this again. I have it. <laughs> I have a sister who's extremely athletic, lives in Wilmette. And uh, she and her husband regularly ski. She's a regular tennis player with a team. Mm -hmm. And more power to her. I love her. We're different as night and day. <coughs> I'm going to stay with her tonight. But um, she thinks I live in just an awful community. And that's Pilsen. And have you ever been to Pilsen or visited? No. no. And yeah, it is south of the loop. We live on. Um, eight, 19th Street in the Victorian house that I did a watercolor of that's pictured on the card. So I go and visit her. It's okay. She doesn't come and visit you. She did, except um, she, her car was compromised slightly one of the, okay. one of the times. And um, uh, She's a fabulous person. I don't want to miss out on her company. 
So I go visit her. Okay. Her husband's fabulous too. Anyway, you can now see the shadows that are cast by this snow, by the icicles. When this is done as, it, as done as it's going to be today, because I undoubtedly will have more work to do, I'm going to go back and paint over the areas that I've added and maybe even some more areas. I'm also planning to, but not today, adding another branch <laughs> over this branch so that it will really give the feeling of layered distance so that you get the feeling that there's a foreground of one branch, middle ground of another, and then these two trees in the distance. So I like the three-dimensional layered approach. Um, okay, I can begin down here and make one of the steps, and I'm going to have it go over the edge so that it doesn't look like it's too much balanced with this stone over here. So I'm going to make a walkway of steps and I'm going to make the first two three-dimensionally, and then I'm going to paint the others or have it in low relief with just the watercolor paper. I think it's interesting to have a little bit of human intervention that way, as if the bridge isn't enough. And that's an interpretation of the bridge. It actually has another bridge behind it, which you can see from this photo here. And in the watercolor I sent around for the fall, there's even more of a bridge above it, but I've taken the license of not adding that bridge. Uh, if anybody would like to pass around these pictures, they may. I will not be using them as reference because I've looked at this many times. Okay, I am going to add another stone down here. And I may add a second and a third. That may be all I add today because I would really like to show you that, yes, I can paint. <laughs> <laughs> but this is setting it up. And um, when it is done, I will send the image to Judy, and then she can send it to all the rest of you. But I'm going to be working on it in the time that we have. It won't get done, probably, but it will be an approximation of what you will see. And um, I'm excited. Again, you're just a great group. You always decide before you start painting that this one's going to be 3D, or do you do the whole painting and then say, hmm, I think I need 3D? Well, it depends. If I'm asked to do something 3D, I will. This was originally going to be um, 3D um, many years ago, and then I didn't have time, and I put it in my drawer. And I thought, and today, or yesterday, I was actually thinking of doing a scene from the Chicago Botanic Gardens, but none of them had quite the drama of this. And I like drama in paintings. I really, really do. So um, that's what I'm giving you, like it or not. OK, I am going to do a quick painting a painting of one of the uh, walkways, one of the steps. My, that's gray. Red is a, a color that really makes compositions sing. I also like to vary my neutrals within the same um, within the same shapes. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Okay, we have here an oval stone for the walkway with some white left for the snow. And when I cut it, it will be even more of an oval than it is now. 
that's going to be pasted right down here. Give it some human interest. Do you put figures in your work? Oh, sometimes, yes. Um, in fact, I have a whole portfolio of work with me. Um, that if you're interested afterwards, if you want to see some more of my work and ask some more questions, you can. <clears throat> we can break whenever you are ready to in the next 10-15 minutes, now or later on. Okay, I'm going to make a couple of steps. And cut it. I like to cut and then pull away. Okay. Is that convincing? Good. It will contrast with the rocks because it's man-made. I might add um, some of the snow at the bottom by just cutting it in such a manner that it's not cut off looking. Okay, does that look too much like Granny's pillbox hat that she wears to church? Or does it look like a stone in the walkway? Does that work? I can't tell. I, don't ha I have no objectivity. Okay, I'll give it a lift. Then I think we'll be able to see. And I will get rid of that line at the top because it looks contrived. We don't like contrivance, do we? No, no. And you know what? I will add some shadow underneath. And that looks like a frozen worm. So do you put most of your lifts and your paintings um, down in the foreground rather than the background? Yes, Let's unless... The question in, because people in the back are here. Ah, she asked a very good question. Do I put most of the lifts in my paintings in the foreground uh, <laughs> instead of the background? In this example, yes, but if I have a bird somewhere, there would be a lift underneath the bird. Yeah, that's a very good question. If a work is abstract, you can have lifts virtually anywhere. Okay, I am going to paint the background dark in back of here so that it shows more, um, let's see, more robustly. I'm going to use a sponge, a watercolor sponge, to make it so that the blending is soft and not hard edged. Okay. I want to make sure it's dark enough and that it blends with the background. Okay. Part behind the um, <clears throat> the steps are going to be darker, so that the steps pop out with more def 
definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see what I'm doing and why? I'm wanting to leave that juicy um, <clears throat> manganese blue in there. I don't want anything to happen to that. Okay. Does that work? Does that look like a step along the walkway? Good. Now for the lift. And there's always a danger when you don't cover the edges of <laughs> spatters of paint getting onto the edge of the mat board. And um, the way I've circumvented that sometimes is to make a few specks looking like um, pieces of snow or pieces of rock that um, <clears throat> become part of the composition. Sometimes I wet it down very quickly, which I'll try to do now. If it doesn't erase it, I'll think of another solution later. There are all kinds of solutions. I mean, this is something that you really shouldn't worry about screwing up <clears throat> when you work on it. Okay, a, a lift will make that work. A lift. Have you, have you ever tried Mr. Clean erasers to get rid of some of those spatters? Never heard of them. They're very gentle and, and they don't uh, scrub off your paper. I learned something. Yeah. I will I will look into that. I remember the Mr. Clean song growing up. Yeah. You clean your stove real good. Yeah, that's right. Clean your stove. <laughs> I hit it right. Yeah, Mr. Clean and Popeye were definitely two figures in my childhood. As well as the family dog. A quick cut here and there. How about a cardinal? Would a cardinal work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're much better. Mm -hmm. All right, you. There. If you've heard of an artist in St. Louis named Carol Carter, oh, yeah. Yeah. she's a very close friend of mine. We are giving a joint workshop this fall in September 8th, 7th and 8th at the Maxwell Street Community Garden that I belong to. She is the one that uh, reached out to me for artists for climate awareness and said you would be a shoe-in, so I joined. She is just now stepping down from being one of the co being the co-president, but um, she said to me, "I can never picture you doing just straight watercolor because I think you're a builder." And I said, "You're right, Carol." <laughs> anyway, we were we were in touch often. We both went to Principia College. We were both on that same European trip together. We both studied with James Green. And we both owe him a debt of gratitude, even when he was one of the worst, sorry, male chauvinists we've ever met. <laughs> so here it is, and I'm going to put the backing on. Yeah, Carol's a delight. I love her dearly. We had her for a workshop, what, five years ago, maybe, Carol? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, you, you had a treat there. No, it is archival. It will not, the, the yellow will not creep into your composition later on, like um, rubber cement glue will. But it's still effective, because I had some at home that turned yellow, and I didn't think it was any good anymore. <laughs> 
No, it will be. As long as it's supple. If it's dry, you can't use it for anything. Okay. So I glued the back of it on. The back can be as humble as you like it to be. Nobody's going to see it except for the sides. Okay. Just pound it down with my fist. How long does that take to dry? Oh, I would say roughly a couple of hours. Okay. Yeah, I, I use it for a lot of things. Okay, now I'm going to paint around the edges. Hopefully, yeah, this acrylic mixture is still supple. <coughs> if you wanted to reposition any of those pieces after you had put it together mm -hmm. and really looked at it, the, uh, this needs to be moved over slightly, or, is that possible with that? If you cut it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very gingerly, because otherwise you'll tear the paper behind it. I mean, anything's possible. Yeah. But I'd recommend placing um, items exactly where you want them to be. I um, did a series in, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the year that was, 2008, called Lessons from a House. And it was about. Um, the trials and tribulations of having purchased my Victorian house in 1993, I really felt like a kid who had just inherited a country, you know, like a, a young queen. I just, I had so many, I had so much self-doubt, whereas I was much, brought me down and taught me a lot of important lessons. And this series was a series of mostly three-dimensional watercolors, one of them being my back garden. And the back garden of the house was very, very charming. And it had, you know, a number of interesting plantings. And the 3D watercolor I did, that one frame was like 48 inches by 36 inches. Um, I put into the Elmhurst Art Guild show for the first time when I decided to join um, at somebody else's urging in 2015, and darned if it didn't win best of show. I didn't expect anything. But um, my husband and I went out for dinner to an Italian place nearby with some friends, and as we were walking in the door, somebody said, you won best of show. So I had to quickly give us an unprepared speech. <laughs> but uh, people do like them. Um, and you'll find when you do them that you're going to get a lot of interest from people. And it's not everybody's cup of tea. It does take a certain amount of elbow grease. All right. There we go. Does that work? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you think so. But I will have a shorter lift. Um, I will do one over here, and it will be on the watercolor paper. Do we want to take a break now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's take a break. About this white shape that was cut out up here, and I've made it into a um, bush that is an evergreen. I grew up with parents that were horticulturists, so I would say that this is, this could be a hollyberry tree. I have two holly bushes out in front of my house in Pilsen that you all have um, looked at on my cards if you picked them up. And in my rendering, I not only have one of my husband's sculptures of Desdemona, because he's a jealous husband and he loves doing images of Desdemona from the tragedy of Othello. And that was, he started that during my curating of the Shakespeare shows. But I also have two holly bushes, one named Nancy, one named Ralph, after my parents. And um, Nancy produces holly berries because Ralph is next to her. And you can't, 
a holly bush, you have to have a male and female holly bush in order for there to be berries. So this is another incarnation of Ralph and Nancy. So I'm painting green very kind of calligraphically so that it doesn't look definitely like one kind of tree or another. Again, this composition is about art. It's not about geology or botany or when I paint in the, um, or, or paste in the two cardinals that I plan to, to do later on. It's not about ornithology. It's about art and it's about composition and it's about creating feeling. And I am missing a, a tree with red berries. Now if I put red in the holly, berry, the holly tree up here, that would make the eye travel to the upper left. And that's really not what we want to do. Um, the eye could travel um, either here or here because I think this left of center portion is the most interesting part of the composition in terms of where the eye can go. I will paint a bush with red berries that where um, the leaves have been mostly abandoned right here. And I'm not sure what kind of tree that is. Maybe I'll look up trees of and bushes of Starved Rock, State, Starved Rock State Park, and I'll be able to talk more um, with, with more knowledge. But in the meantime, winterberry? Hmm. Are they red? Oh, yes, absolutely. Good. That was the right thing to do. And that was the right answer at the right time. I'm a real believer in synchronicity. I could go on and on. But right now, I will stick to painting. I will make the outline of a tree. And it will have those red berries. I don't want to make it too large and distracting, but it will definitely have what I say it's going to have. And it will have several different um, roots from the bottom. It won't be just a scrawny little bush out in the middle of nowhere. It'll have some presence. And I think you're seeing it as I'm painting it. Am I right? Yep. Good. And because my falcon was painted in the upper left of that one painting that I told you about earlier, um, the um, cardinals are going to be coming over from this side. Is that a bird there on that one branch? Um, no, but like hey, I could I could put put them on these branches. Mm -hmm. You just opened up something, which is great. I always learn from students. I always learn from audiences. Someone introduced birds, me. I would think that the birds would be eyeing that bush. Ah, you got something there. I want it to be prominent and stand out from the dry leaves that are coming down from this opposite um, bank. So I'm going to put a, a dark line around the edge for a shadow, and then I will place the berries. I'll place some of them on the ground. Mm -hmm. Did I hear someone ask, what is that supposed to be? Well, we're looking at where the bridge ends. Oh, right here? No, to, all the way to the right of the bridge. Ah, uh, this is a tree behind and there. Come, and come down, right above there. The little dark area. Down, oh, down, so down. The yeah, by the ice cube. Down, by the ice cube. Keep going down. To the left. Stop, right right to the left there. Right there. Uh, <laughs> up, up to the right. Oh, there. Right here. This point. Right looks here. like it could oh, be a bird right yeah. there. Oh, yeah. no. Um, those are some more ice falls. Oh. oh, oh. See how they were... Oh. They could also be part of a root system, but I, I admitted it as ice falls. And when I get around to painting that area, it could be anything. It could be a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> no squirrel. No, I, I don't like to paint squirrels in. 
things. <laughs> I find them very pesky and uninteresting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. dig up your yard and eat all your spring bulbs. And <laughs> they don't like daffodils. No, we have a feral cat that's been coming to the door. A tulip bloom in my yard. That's right. They almost bloom. And I just bought a whole stack of cat food the other day. Uh -oh. Yeah, I've already named her. She started coming in August and September in October, and then she disappeared after we went on a brief vacation around Thanksgiving, and we just saw her the other day. She's been back about four times. Okay. Wanting to make this as natural looking as possible. I'll add some more stems to them to connect them so that they're not out of space. Ah, there really should be a lot of them because there's so many large neutral shapes around them. I don't want them to become big like apples. That would be a little confusing to the audience. But I don't want it to be so small that it's diminutive. I think I might have it come in back of the branches so it can really be visible. If you look at my website, you'll probably wonder, why hasn't she put in anything since 2018? That's because I haven't had the time, and I've got to um, beef up my website very soon. Because I've done a lot, a lot of work since then. I am on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to follow me, come aboard. I'll follow you. OK, this is what we have so far. Do I need more red berries, or is this enough? Yeah. Well, at least there's a tree there. Yeah. You've, got, um, you've got a number of berries. Yeah, I think I'll make another one closer in. Yeah, so it won't look like it's accidental. I'll paint the, ber the berries first and then the tree. Because I really want the berries to be visible. Now I'll leave a little bit of white space on them so it looks like there's glistening. And maybe closer up I'll have a, eventually a 3D tree with red berries. Do you all know what U bushes are, E-W-E? Are you familiar with the red berries on U bushes? When I was little, I used to eat them like popcorn. And I had no idea that they were poisonous. <laughs> and, I told, and I told my dad later on, when I was more grown up, that I used to eat those. He said, no! <laughs> Being the, the horticulturist that he is, he knew the name of every single plant. You know, he was in World War II. He was a war hero on his ship the USS Daily, and my eldest sister, um, you know, um, urged him to write his war memoirs a few years before we didn't have him anymore around. You know, it was a very hard time for us, but we had his memoirs. And this year I decided to read them again and put something on Facebook I remember he was writing about seeing Nagasaki for the first time and how, you know, it was like a big dreadful hole in the middle of um, an edge of where there was a lot of beauty. And he mentioned, um, you know, the, adept, the adeptness of the Japanese gardeners and how they <clears throat> could make these wonderful gardens growing up in rocky stepped areas. And then he said that later on, 
um, shortly after that, his ship was in charge of taking care of a group of um, Korean prisoners of war from Japan and how scared they looked at first. And he said, just another example of the great imposition that war has on all of us. And I thought, those memoirs show his the side of him that was a horticulturist and a humanitarian. So I was happy to share that. So bottom line, he knew a lot about plants. And bottom line, he was glad that I didn't have any residual effects from having eaten the yew berries as a good young child. So these are winter berries. Yeah. Every time I see this piece from now on, I'm going to think of you as a group and how much you helped inspire me to finish this in a way that is not only interesting, but makes sense. Yeah. After I get um, you know, the mailing from Judy, with her permission, with all of your permission, I will be happy to let you know about my show at the North Shore YMCA. It's called Climates with Water, and I hope you'll all attend. Did you say when it is? Um, it is in April. I'm not sure of the date of the opening. I'm going to make the invitation this week. I should have had it ready for today, but I've been preoccupied with uh, um, my large commission back home. My life has been very segmented this year because of that, but it's worth it. I don't mean the show, I mean the commission. I'm grateful to have the show. It's mostly paintings from location in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, one of our favorite parts of the United States to visit, and some of the southern states like um, North Carolina, South Carolina and Florida and Tennessee. We like to stay at, at this one certain cabin in Pigeon Forge when we're pass, passing through. Beautiful area. And some of my cards have some images in them of uh, the trip from last summer that, uh, or la last spring rather, that was um, based on my ferreting out pictures that, or images that expressed climate, a certain amount of climate awareness. And if you want to thumb through that um, small pamphlet afterwards that has the images in it and some of my impressions of what's happening in different parts of the United States. I think this has enough red. Do you think? In the time we have left, I will also paint in some trees where I have already started the branches up, up here. And um, I'm going to put one tree behind this trunk. And I'm going to put some white on the trunk right now to express the fact that there's snow on those trees. Yeah. Thank you. Dry brush. Good. It is big to frame. But I've seen bigger. Have any of you been to Munising, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula? Yes. Have you seen the pictured rocks? Yes. For this show, if I have time, I want to do a huge watercolor of some of the pictured rocks compositions that I took from um, the trip that we took in the boat, the tourist boat, past the rocks. It looks like 
um, the Great Lakes rise, <laughs> it looks like, I'm sorry, the Grand Canyon rising up out of the Great Lakes. Oh. Oh, really? Where is it in Michigan? Munising in the Upper Peninsula. I had never even heard of Munising until I let my fingers do the walking when my husband and I were looking for places to stay. And I said, well, this looks pretty good. He thought, yeah, it looks great. About halfway along the top. Yes. When you get to Escanaba, just keep it going straight up. Yeah, that's right. Now, the Upper Peninsula is a whole new world in and of itself. It's no place for sissies in the wintertime. I haven't, I haven't been. Oh my goodness, the, the snow is really All making a difference. Last week, my friends up there had 51 degrees when it was 34 here. <laughs> That's a big year. What a reverse. Yeah, the snow is adding a lot to those branches. I think. It's making them come forward. It's making them more interesting. Uh, in some places, you can actually see uh, the, um, that I painted them over the bridge. So this is kind of taking away and adding a layer of opacity. Okay. I think it's going to make a difference here too, adding the snow on top. Not too much, just a little bit. And not slick and, um, you know, hard edged. Yeah. Okay. It ties the other pieces of snow and the ice together. It does create a sense of cohesion. It is beginning to do that. I'll make these whiter. Okay, some of these have moss on them. I will be adding more green because this definitely, the composition definitely needs more green. When it comes to color, I like there to be a dominant composition. And this one is um, very complementary with yellows and violets, and also with blues and dusky oranges. But I feel it for a composition to truly be successful in my mind unless it's meant to be monochromatic or meant to be analogous, I like for a little of all the 12 major colors of the color wheel to show in some area, even if it's a small amount. I want to add more green to this and uh, more red, some blue-greens, some red-violets. Uh, it does have some red-violet, um, some red-orange but only a small amount. That, it, that way, the composition truly sings. But again, there's nothing wrong with monochromatic or analogous. It's just we all have our own aesthetic when it comes to color. And I like in this dry brush approach that you can see some of the grain of the watercolor paper. Some areas look like solid whitish gray, others look more feathery. I like that juxtaposition to use a too often used word. Juxtaposition. Okay, it's looking more wintry all the time. <laughs> and we could have the bluff looking more like rocks instead of here looking like a pile of donuts. <laughs> Okay, let's make it come to life. For three Thanksgivings in a row, my husband and I went to Starved Rock, and I would walk out onto the ledge at Matheson, sit there, and paint a rushing creek. 
that was, I would be sitting here and I would be painting over there. One of my packs of cards might have that image. I don't know. But this is termed a lake shelter. And it really does have the feeling of being, indeed, a shelter. All right. Oh, you know, I was going to paint down here. I got distracted, and then I put the water there. It happens. It's probably because I haven't eaten in a while. <laughs> My brain needs fuel. OK, let's start with this first. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to paint some lines so that you can see that it's a bluff formation, and again, not a pile of donuts. I didn't see the donuts till you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. Okay, hands. Light against dark, warm against cool. Works every time. Some more lines to just give it some geologic definition. Adding some more, some burnt sienna to the edges, making them more important, making them more prominent. Because after all, Starved Rock is about the incredible bluff formations. And I'm going to have it come through this moss. This is moss, and I'm going to add some green to it. And yes, you can see moss in the wintertime. There last um, spring in the Matheson, I was, t I was teaching at the workshop in Ottawa, and they told me to go here, and they said, "Don't go to Star Rock, and go to Matheson because they're a little bit nicer." Make sure you bring um, waterproof shoes. No. <laughs> Very good idea. <laughs> because you, you're crossing a bunch of water to get to the one, and it's way, it's beautiful. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous, absolutely mm -hmm. gorgeous. You can see, it's, and bridges overhead, and it's like a little. Yes. Valley. It's just beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. There are two different entrance ways. You might have gone on the entrance way at the far end off of the road that leads from Starved Rock and goes straight. The one that we usually go to, you make a right at the top of that hill and you go through what looks like a gated, it's not a gated community, but it's a community of nice houses and then there's a oh, golf yeah, course. Oh yeah, I saw that. Is that right? Golf course, I think? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I That's went the other way. Is. I was the other way. Yeah, I've gone that way too. In fact, I've I painted looking over one of those bluffs in the middle of a bridge. Okay. And this it's is... not in the Star Rock. It's the Star Rock. It's a, it's south of Star Rock. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole, you never even know. I would have never known it because I always go to Star Rock. And that's beautiful too. But yeah. this is totally away from it, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. I think it's I think it's better than most people say it's better than the Star Rock stuff. Wow. I would agree with that. Mm. And it's really gorgeous. Okay, really, really. I think that there are also leaves in this area. And I'm going to travel up the yellow just a little bit more. There's got to be some ambiguity here. Oh, 
Okay, they could be leaves. Leaves and moss and snow. How's that for a combination? <laughs> A little more yellow. There's some colors you find that, that dry that get dry more rap, grow more readily than others. You have to keep adding water. That this is one. I think this is a really in yellow. Yeah. I'm traveling it around so that it goes behind the branch a little bit. Yeah, that makes a more interesting shape in the composition. So that's leaves and moss and snow. We have just about five more minutes. Five more minutes? Okay. Tie up every loose end I've got. <laughs> I will add a little bit of snow to this passage of color. What color are you using for that white? Gouache. You can't mix white. <laughs> Actually, with White, white is the term is termed the absence of all pigment, right. mm -hmm. and when it comes to light, white is the presence okay, of all color. Chinese white doesn't work. No, this is titanium. <coughs> so this is some white mixed with a little moss, mossy green, mixed with a little bit of Venetian red for fallen leaves. Okay, and if I can tie up a few loose ends, I could make this look more like bluffs over here. Actually, this um, the engineers who had built this bridge and probably designed the park initially had a very good idea, and that was to bolster this area um, on either side of the waterfall with brick and then continuing with the bluffs on the other side. So you've got two kinds of building here, one man-made and one nature-made. <clears throat> I'm going to add more violet. I love cobalt violet. It's one of those expensive colors. <coughs> yeah, and there's some more bluff up here, too. Right now, I'm mostly paying attention to structure. I see another tree with berries on the horizon. <laughs> Whenever I put lines in for bluffs, I immediately soften them. <clears throat> Looking for my paper towel. Right here, right here. Oh. By Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, he's indefatigable every time. <laughs> Just love to show off those big words. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Artists oftentimes are not <clears throat> known for being terribly, terribly adept at being wordsmiths. Try to counteract that stereotype. Aha. I think I will paint this tree another color. I will combine the Venetian red again with the cobalt blue, cobalt ultramarine. And it will pop out behind these branches. I oftentimes like to leave a little bit of a line <coughs> around what I'm painting because it pops it out, the shapes. I remember one friend of mine said, well, sometimes it's, you can't really tell um, where the light is coming from when you do that. You should be conscious of where the light is coming from. So because it was another artist who told me that, I tried to pay attention, but not always. Thank you so much for coming all this way in. Here's the card you passed around. My Let's pleasure. Thank you for a beautiful job. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Do you want to hold it up for us so we don't have yeah. to Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can I finish this uh, sure. painting around first? <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have anything to do for another hour or so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. OK. Let's get a little more of this red in here. Nice. <laughs> Almost done. <laughs>